Hi, this is Claudia Pilos um, with the Center for Hellenic Studies. And I'm so happy to, uh, to be here today with everyone. We have our community members here from Hour 25 and from Heroes X. And we're so delighted uh, to welcome Mr. Yanis Petropoulos today uh, as our speaker, who's going to talk to us today uh, about monsters in Hesiod and Homer. Yanis, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. A pleasure indeed to be with you. Um, I'm in Greece at the moment. And so welcome everybody and thank you for for being there or here. Yes, so. thank you. Um, and, and you know, yes, we have people joining from all over, um, but I just want to give them a sense of, of what you've been doing, okay? So I just want to share that you are currently the professor of ancient Greek literature at the Democritian University of Thrace. You're also the center of, um, you're also the director of the Center for Hellenic Studies in Greece, which we're so happy to share, so you really are part of the CHS family. Uh, in 2013, you were a visiting professor of classics at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and you are currently the research fellow at Biblioteca Mindlin uh, at that same university. Right now, you're working on monsters in early Brazilian ethno history. Your latest book, Cleos in a Minor Key, The Homeric Education of a Little Prince, is published through the Harvard University Press and is currently available through CHS Online Publications. Everyone can read the entire beautiful text for free. I encourage everyone to do that. Uh, and your next book, uh, which is forthcoming very soon, is titled Residence of the Via Negativa, Homer's Cyclopes and Other Monsters. So thank you again. Uh, we're happy to share that. And I'm really excited to welcome you and have you start our discussion. Thank you. Thank you again. So, without further ado, I'll, I'll start. In the Theogony, monsters are born before the establishment of Zeus's reign, and therefore before the, the birth of the Muses. Uh, monsters exist before song and poetry. After vanquishing Typhoeus, or Typhon, <laughs> the most fearsome of monsters, Zeus ascends to the throne and after several marriages mates with Mnemosyne, a titaness and a kind of monster herself, by whom he procreates the muses. Uh, that's Theogony 9.15 and following. Had Zeus failed to eliminate Tufoeus, there would be no muses, no socially constructive speech inspired by them, no song and no Theogony. One of the subjects listed in the poem's unusually explicit table of contents, verses 105 through 107, is the snippet I'm interested in, um, are the immortal offspring of gloomy Nux, night, and Halmeros, Pondos, briny sea, verse 107. The four generations of Pontids are nothing but concrete monsters. Indeed, monsters, which by and large are antisocial, anti-cultural, destructive entities, ironically make up a large part of a poem whose performance is meant to consolidate calm and social cohesion via the rule of kings, Basileis. Well, what is a monster? Or rather, uh, what do Hesiodic and Homeric poetry understand by monsters, terata? Pelora. Monsters in archaic poetry differ but little from a child's notion of a monster in the 21st century. I recently asked my nephew Gavin, aged seven, to be a monster, and he obliged with a nod, I suspect, to Disney and the Cookie Monster and other grown up influences. But what he did may still give us insight into monsters at a universal level. This is how he evoked a monster. He intoned, grrrr, baring his imaginary fangs and threatening to eat me up. He produced a loud cookie monster voice. Related to this, he made inarticulate noises. He thrust forth his imaginary claws, and he generally tried to scare me through his make-believe aggressiveness and malevolence. Now turning to Homer and Hesiod, I shall briefly list some key physical and moral traits of monsters, some of which my nephew acted out, and I'll enumerate them. One, many monsters, many, have prominent teeth, the better to eat us. 
In general, their oral cavity and appetite smell, spell doom for those unlucky enough to be near them. Skula, or Sila, in Odyssey 12 verses 91 and following, has three rows of teeth in each of her six heads, a total of 18 rows of teeth, and she katesthie, she devoured her victims. Charybdis, a monstrous vanishing hole in the sea, gulps and regurgitates seawater like a gluttonous throat. She has a transparent digestive tract tracked, it seems, verses uh, 104, book 12, verses 104 and following. Cyclops probably has teeth, though Homer does not tell us so, but we are told that he has a belly that fills up when he too, katasthie, devours Odysseus's men. That's book 9, 296. Monsters are appetitive creatures. In the Homeric Hymn to Apollo, verses 300 and following, it's not on the reading list, the huge female monster serpent, Drachina, is said to be Zdatrephes, well-fed, and thus, in Martin West's translation, bloated. Two, monsters make, or may make, nonsensical sounds that confuse us. Hesiod's Typhoeus emits a jangling, baffling medley of divine and animal voices and a strange hissing. This is sonic chaos or uh, sonic hybridity. So this brings me to my third point. I was referring incidentally to Theogony verses 829 and thir to 35. We, we can look at those uh, verses uh, in a moment. Well, related to what I just said, the number three, many monsters are physical hybrids in German, Mischwesen, mixed creatures that mix us up in a cognitive sense by cutting across different species and categories. Besides this, they may also be malformed or deformed. Their deformity, if we apply Aristotle's criteria, in his generation of animals consists in either a redundancy through multiplication of anatomical parts or conversely a deficiency. Too many heads, one eye, uh, gigantism, nanism and so forth. This deformity is usually combined, either way, this deformity is, is combined with extremes of size. Being in whole or in part oddities of morphology and content, monsters are usually ugly or partly beautiful, partly ugly. Their offense against symmetry in ordinary size makes it hard for people to take them in cognitively, to apprehend them. Four, related to the preceding point, their outer ugliness reflects their definitional malevolence, their antisocial character. Hence, they are routinely described as being a kakon pema, a pest, pestilence, uh, wreaking evil or evils, kaka among men, animal and crops, and civilized existence in general. But their evil is social, not theological. Uh, mind you, there are fair monsters, good monsters too, such as Chiron, Cecrops, Proteus, Pegasus, and many, many others. Five, related to their unusualness is their standard non-resemblance, what Germans call Unähnlichkeit, their non-resemblance to any kindred category of being, whether God, man, both a beast or animal. As noted, monsters cannot readily be pigeonholed unless a poet tries to insert them into an ontological category and this Homer does with limited success in the case of Polyphemus. Their radical physical eccentricity arises out of their simultaneous hybridity and deformity and bears out the primary sense of the term teras, an unusual or rare sign and by extension a rare physical phenomenon serving as an omen. Their unfamiliar aspect serves to remind us that monsters are other or the other. They are vehicles of de 
familiarization. Monsters, number six, monsters have an ambivalent metaphysical aspect, which I can only touch upon. They are, in their original sense, an ill omen, a warning sent by the gods, but they may also represent the mystery of God or the gods in a grotesque form. And here I'm paraphrasing, I hope not grotesquely, uh, the theologian Rudolf Otto and many of his uh, followers. So they represent the, minis the, the numinous, the, the mystery of God or the gods, but in a perverse, grotesque form. A monster elicits in man the same reactions as those provoked by the experience of the divine or numinous. Wonder, bafflement, fear, even fascination. To get a notion of the sublime overtones of a monster, we might consider the water dragon Leviathan, known mainly from the book of Job, chapter 41. And the book of Job dates, uh, perhaps dates to the seventh century before Christ. Leviathan is arguably a chaos monster, or as Harold Bloom suggests, a symbol, and I quote, of the tyranny of nature over men, end of quote. He is at once a violent monster who threatens Yahweh's rule and is therefore destroyed, but also Yahweh's creation and playmate with which he, God, identifies. Because Leviathan sums up many traits of Greek monsters, he is useful to my purposes. Very quickly then, I list a few, and I refer you then to um, Job 41, one of, the, uh, one of the focus texts. Leviathan, first of all, is an untamable, unassailable hybrid. So let's look at verses 8, uh, 10, 12, and 26. I, I quote 8. Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. Uh, 10. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? This is Yahweh speaking in the so-called whirlwind uh, speech. And 26. 26. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. So Leviathan is indomitable. He's uh, intractable. And this recalls Homeric Chimera and Scylla, who, or Scylla, who is, um, etymologically at least, well, by a twisted, almost monstrous etymology, she's meant to be a puppy, a whelp. So she, she has this tender side to her, but um, she is first and foremost an unassailable hybrid. Well, next, uh, this water dragon's teeth are terrifying. Uh, I refer you to verse 14. Um, Who can open the doors of his face? Around his teeth is terror. Third, he has flashing eyes and breathes fire. Um, I won't quote the relevant passages, but compare Dracondis and, uh, in particular, fire-spouting Chimera and Typhoeus, fiery-eyed and fire-breathing. And fourth, most important, verse 33, and I quote, on earth there is not his like. This suggests that the creature is unparalleled and beyond description. This is a very important verse, according to theologians. How might one come to grips with this toothy sea reptile with armored scales, beautiful proportions, and smoking nostrils? Faced with this visual impossibility, the text is here trying to, and I quote uh, the theologian Thomas Beale, uh, Timothy Beale, is trying to go beyond language. Job is trying to go beyond language here. Well, this brings me uh, to, find, to my last topic, or to my main topic, which is the otherness of Homeric and Hesiotic monsters, and how these poetic texts set out to convey these beings as being as, as out of the ordinary and otherworldly. There are several ways, general and more particular, to describe a monster in Homer and Hesiod. Let's first look at Homer. With a few exceptions, monsters are treated briefly in Homer. 
or Homeric poetry. In the Iliad, their treatment is sometimes highly elusive. As a rule, epic descriptions of monsters occur in the direct speech of first-person reminiscence. In the Iliad, these um, analepses, these flashbacks, serve to thrust monsters to the more distant past and places, such as Lycia in the time of Bellerophontes, the speaker Glaucus's grandfather. I'm referring to Iliad 6, the tale of the uh, Chimera. The Odyssey. In the Odyssey, Odysseus delivers his apologoi, or first-person accounts, of monsters in exotic lands. In the Theogony, monsters occur in a catalogue spoken in the third person. The rule of thumb for Homer and Hesiod, and epic poets the world over, is, as uh, Morris Barra puts it, and I quote, to rely on vague horror and undefined dread, and to assume that everyone knows what the monster is, and that it therefore needs little or no description, end of quote. Now, there is a particular idiom which the Odyssey and the Theogony alike often employ when conjuring monsters and extraordinary places. Malcolm Davis, in, his, in two pioneering articles, one of which I have cited, uh, calls this method, I quote, description by negation, end of quote, and links it specifically to evocations of the world before creation, paradise, paradisal life, and miraculous beings and things. What these subjects have in common is the fact that they represent something not seen before and therefore hard to conceptualize, which moreover is the antithesis or inversion of the normal. The formal structure used in such descriptions is this. It isn't, it doesn't do, it doesn't have A. It isn't, it doesn't do, it doesn't have B. It doesn't have C, and so forth. But it is A, it does A, it has A, I'm sorry, it, but it, it is, it does, it has D, forgive me, where A, B, and C are desirable or undesirable terms according to the context, and the climaxing term D is likewise desirable or undesirable. So the, the format is it isn't A, it isn't B, it isn't C, and so forth, but it is D. This structure originated, I suggest, from sacral language cast in the negative about gods, which was later extended uh, from ritual more generally to descriptions of otherworldly subjects. A convenient comparandum is the apophatic formulations of Christian theology and prayer. If I may just very quickly cite um, Theophilus, uh, an early Christian apologist. Uh, it's one of the uh, focus passages. Theophilus of Antioch, late second century, the form of God is ineffable and indescribable and cannot be seen with eyes of flesh. He is in glory, uncontainable, in greatness, incomprehensible, in loftiness, inconceivable, in strength, incomparable, and so on and so forth. Lest we get lost on the Christian uh, via ne negativa, uh, let's quickly consider for easy instance, Odyssey 4, verses 461 and following, especially 566 uh, through 8, where Proteus, a typical hybrid monster, predicts the blissful afterlife of Menelaus, if I may quote it from the Loeb translation, slightly modified. But for yourself, Menelaus, it is not ordained by the gods that you should die, but to the El Elysian plain and the ends of the earth, the gods will convey you. No snow is there, nor heavy storm, nor ever rain, but always Okeanos, uh, Okeanos sends up blasts of the west wind and so forth. These ironically are the words of a monster, albeit a sage one, knowledgeable about the depths of the sea and the future. In the Apologoi, Odysseus uses a series of negations to describe the inversions in the lifestyle of a race of monsters, the Kuklokes, and I quote uh, Odyssey 9 verses 105 through 115, trusting in the immortal gods, they, the Cyclopes, 
plant nothing with their hands nor plow. But all these things, crops, um, sprout without sowing or plowing, wheat and barley and vines. Neither assemblies for counsel have they, nor appointed laws, but they dwell on the peaks of mountains, in hollow caves, and each lays down the law for his children and wives, and they have no care for one another. Here language about gods and the miraculous has been appropriated by ethnographic discourse. Odysseus has turned a foreign race or society into monsters. Their deformity is not only physiological but also, also cultural and social. The Cyclopes hark forward to the racial or ethnic monsters of later Greek and Latin ethnography, amounting to some 40 races such as the Dogheads of India uh, and the Longheads in the Scythia. And by the way, this really fed into the stream of the colonial discourse about Latin American cannibals. I turn to Hesiod's Theogony. Even in his longer descriptions of monsters, such as Typhon, uh, Hesiod does not resort to strings of negative statements, though he does use a series of negatives when describing the life of the golden generation in works and days. In his treatment of monsters, however, the poet generally uses one or more adjectives prefixed with a privative alpha or equivalent negative expressions. Um, just a few examples. Uh, Theogony um, 295 and following. Uh, echidna, or echidna, in, in ancient Greek it would be echidna, ultimately descended from um, the monstrous family tree of Pontos, the sea, is the most prolific, promiscuous member of Hesiod's self-contained serpentarium. The daughter of Cato and Phorcus, she is the, the mother of six snake-like monsters, two of them through incest. Born in a cave, she subsequently lives in one. Perhaps it's the same cave somewhere, perhaps Asia Minor or Italy. Uh, here is Hesiod's uh, description. This is uh, Theogony 295 and following. She, Cato, um, bore another monster, Peloron, an unmanageable one, well, that's how, how West renders Amekanon, an intractable one, in no way resembling, you see, we have these two negatives from the very start, in no way resembling either mortal human beings or the, the undying gods, in a hollow cave, the divine, dauntless Echidna. Half a nymph with bright eyes and beautiful cheeks, half again a monstrous Peloron snake, fearful and huge, shimmering Aeolos, eating raw food, a very important epithet or noun, or may stain under the hidden places of the holy earth. There she has a cave and, uh, and so on. She keeps guard among the Aramoi, whoever they are or whatever they are, uh, under the earth, baleful Echidna, an immortal nymph and unaging all her days. This paradoxical mongrel of a beautiful nymph and a humongous snake is introduced through two negatives, making her unmanageable, intractable, and unlike any other being, god or man. God or man. She defies uh, classification and description. Her composite nature is brought about by her Iolos, her shimmering appearance, Echidna, shifts colors and shades, just as Proteus shifts shapes and Typhoeus voices. She eats raw meat, especially human flesh, according to Aristophanes' frogs. Does she chew her victims or gulp them down uh, like Polyphemus and Hannibal Lecter? Come to think of it, which half of her eats raw food? Daniel Ogden speculates that she has one or more snake heads, up to a hundred on her lower serpent half. So I guess she consumes men at this level, at this end, or from this end. However that may be, Echidna is, thank goodness, far, far away, yet ever lurking in a cave under a rock. Immortal monsters, and, and notice how Hesed stresses uh, her eternal youth. Um, immortal monsters are sometimes poised somehow to return to haunt civilizations, civilization. Well, I, I won't say 
much, I'll leave it for later perhaps, about her son, Cerberus. But I'd, I'd like to conclude with Polyphemus, my favorite monster. Uh, emphatically human in the Odyssey, uh, Polyphemus eats human beings raw. This equates him with the bestial status of the underworld dog, Cerberus. Despite his human nature, the Cyclops is still hard to, de to define. Consider these verses from Odyssey 9. It's 9, 187 through 92. There, in the cave by the sea, a monstrous man, Aner Pelorios, spent his nights, who shepherded his flocks alone and afar, and did not mingle with others, but lived apart, knowing no law. For he was a monstrous marvel, Thauma Pelorion, and was not like a bread-eating man, Cetophagos, uh, but like a wooded peak of high mountains which, which stands out to view apart from the rest. Davis's structure is employed to show what an eccentric being Polyphemus is, how different he is from his fellow Cyclopes, and how deeply different from normal men. There is a touch of gallows humor, of course, in the statement, he did not resemble bread-eating man, um, or men, inasmuch as the epithet bread-eating plays on man-eating, androphagos, as others have noticed. Polyphemus has the grandeur of wild nature, but as in the case of Leviathan, who is said to be unlike any other being on earth, this is a highly negative sublimity, to borrow Harold Bloom's description of Leviathan. And Homer sums it up in the expression, monstrous marvel, Thaum Pelorion. To the extent then that a monster can be defined at all, Homer and Hesiod show that it is easier to define something abominable by stating what it is not. A negative formulation is by the same token suitable for a description of something sublime equally out of this world in a positive sense. The language of abomination and monstrosity overlaps the idiom of wonder and admiration. So I'll end there. And yes, thank you. I can, I can take questions. Let's discuss things. And I, I have. Um, I'd like also, if, if time permits, to to quote um, the passage about Cerberus. May I? Um, or, or we can open up. I, I leave it to you. Um, Okay, um, well, why don't we just open up first to see if anyone has any urgent questions uh, to, to start with right now. So it looks like Jackie has, has a question or a comment. And I, I'm listening and just moving to another site. Yeah. No problem, okay. please, Giannis. It, it's very important that you uh, choose the best location. So, Jackie. Huh. Well, Giannis, uh, uh, some of us here have been starting to uh, look at the word, I uh, hope I pronounce it correct, Dinos. And it seems like that is a lot of what you are, uh, it, what, what all the words you're using, a monstrous marvel reflects, uh, it brings to mind dinos to me. I was wondering, uh, but yet you hadn't mentioned that word, and I was wondering what you thought of that, or does it play into this, or is that word really doesn't come up in your research? You mentioned dinos. Dinos, dinos yes. Dinos. Oh, Dinos. Dinos. Yeah. Sorry, Dinos. I yeah. don't pronounce it very well. Yes, yes, Dinos. Well, it, it, it does occur in descriptions of, of monsters and, and monster-like goddesses like uh, Calypso and Kirky, Circe. Uh, Calypso is Dene, as you know, Dene uh, Thea. Um, oh, gosh. Audeesa, right? So, so it it does occur, but it, it it's really a word that conjures um, augustness, and it, it 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 can be the augustness of a god, a divinity. Okay, but so it, it doesn't really apply it, to these abominations. Well, it's um, in, in your... 
Yes, it's used in the sense of, of formidable, of, of fearful, fearsome. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, but I, 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 I wouldn't attach too much importance to it. I, I don't think it, it's, it's a signature of a monster. It's not. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we have a question from Bill. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between Hera and the brood of Echina. There's a pretty intimate relationship. I think I believe she nursed uh, the Hydra and Nebian lion, and she's the one that sent the uh, the Sphinx to Thebes. Mm -hmm. Any uh, thoughts on why she had such an intimate relationship with that little clan? Well, she she's a a, a sort of foster mother of of uh, monsters. Um, uh, so uh, there's a, there's a beautiful book by um, a lady scholar uh, O'Brien, I think, and and she deals with Hera and her n nurturing side. So she's very she's apt. She's liable to to, um, to foster these uh, monsters in order to get back at Zeus. <laughs> Ultimately, that's what's happening. She's, she's uh, the feminine, I, I don't want to sound like a Jungian, but it's, it's the feminine Chthonian uh, principle uh, versus the, the celestial uh, Zeus-dominated um, cosmos. So uh, I, I do really think, and, and I'm sure many other people like Nancy Felsen, who's uh, worked on monsters, would, would agree that here we have um, a chthonic power, Hera, um, nurturing uh, a monster, creating a Frankenstein, as it were, to and and um, letting it loose. Ah, so this is a passage, and Zeus says to Hera, "Will nothing do?" Is that it? Something. Yes, I, I was just uh, that was me, Sarah. Uh, I was, it was just reminding me that that sort of nurturing monster side. I wonder if that's what Zeus is referring to in Iliad four when he's having a row with Hera, one of his rows with Hera, uh, and he actually says, "Will nothing do for you? But it must go within the walls." And eat Priam raw with his sons and all the other Trojans, oh, and yes. to accuse the god of eating humans raw, but they don't even eat flesh. Seems grossly insulting, and I wonder if he's alluding to that. It never occurred to me before. Well, he's 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 um, raising the issue of cannibalism. This is vicarious ca cannibalism. Uh, we never get cannibalism in in the Iliad, as as you know. It's it's a, a taboo subject. Um, the heroes are uh, frustrated cannibals. They leave that, and they fantasize about it. They leave it, of course. To um, to birds of prey and jackals and and other animals, but um, but you know the being omestes um, or omophagoi, um, and and Hec Hecuba wishes she could get her uh, teeth, I think, in in into uh, Achilles' liver. So she's but this is a revenge fantasy, and this is very much what what. Uh, Hera is is well. What Zeus is is ascribing to Hera, um, being monstrous. But um, I, I think uh, what um, you said, dear colleague, um, um, is is very important. That Hera is is linked very closely to monsters, uh, to Chthonian monsters, and and ultimately she's trying to uh, subvert Zeus's cosmos. I think that's what what's at play. And, Thank and you. I, I refer you also to the to the uh, Homeric hymn to Apollo. She, I think, she raises uh, a monster and then finds a foster parent for the monster. Does she not? Um, right. She, <laughs> I, I think she raises uh, Drakina and then and and then. Um, assigns her to a babysitter, Typhon, Typhoeus, something like that. So. Yanis, thank you for those beautiful answers. You know, I'm wondering if anyone else has a quick question or if we should... Oh, Dan, okay, please. Yeah. Then maybe we'll uh, move on to some discussion, uh, some reading questions. Okay. Um, 
So monsters are uncivilized and they are not honored by men. They they don't have uh, they are they they have no sacrifice. They don't receive any sacrifices by men, mm -hmm. and they are hidden most of the time under the depths of sea or in caves. So who is controlling them? And um, are for they um Okay, I'll leave there. I'll leave there. I'll leave my question there. So, do do you mean uh, are monsters worshipped in cult? Have they cult? Right. Is, were they? Do they have cults? Sorry. Were, did did uh did men mortal? Did they get any sacrifices by uh, mortal men? Yes. Yes. Well. Well, it's, they would receive um, cult. Especially if they were good monsters, fair monsters, not foul. Uh, Chiron perhaps did. Uh, Cecrops, the Athenian uh, cultural hero, uh, is a monster. He's he's serpentine, uh, anguiform, as some people call him. He's he's a, he's a snake monster. He received a cult in in Athens at Athens in um, Boeotia, um, and don't forget that this this monstrous being created. Um, matrimony, or, or rather monogamy, <laughs> and and funeral rites. He, he established these these very important things for civilization. So we we have evidence. I I I also came across a reference to a, a um, very bizarre cult to Polyphemus, um, but the the um, the Cyclops. But on the whole, I don't think the monsters. Uh, you you read about in the Theogony were um, recipients of, of cult were not worshipped. I don't think they were worshipped. Thank you. Uh, actually, Maria has a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, Maria, you're, you're muted, Maria. Uh, so to unmute. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Professor Petropoulos, for your presentation and your paper. Uh, I was wondering, your uh, presentation was very thought-provoking, and it made me think of uh, the case of Gerion, which in Stesichorus is represented in a kind of, let's say, benevolent way. I would like to hear your opinion on this particular case of monstrosity, which um, uh, Jenny Strauss Clay has already discussed uh, uh, in her article. Uh, I would be delighted to, to hear your opinion about that. Thank you very much. In in Stesichorus, right? Yeah, yes. and in Stesichorus, and uh, also how, for example, Hesiod presents his genealogy. Uh, I mean, uh, what would you consider Gerion? What kind of monster would you consider? Um, uh, what kind of monster is he? Well, he's a snake monster, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Uh, yes, yes. He's the child. He's a child this, of. He is this. Is he not? Yeah, he is th the three-bodied uh, monster. Uh, he is situated in uh, in the west, and he cares for he for uh, for his cattle. And uh, Heracles goes westwards to meet him. And uh, yeah. um, yes, yes, one of the famous labors. Well, yeah. Well, um, he's one of the children. He's one of the snake children of. of Echidna, is, is, is he not? Well, his father is Chrysaur, and uh, one of, uh, of uh, Okeanides uh, mm -hmm. uh, was his mother. In, in Sezekur, he is presented in a very um, uh, positive uh, uh, way, I must say, despite his monstrosity. And Sezekur mm -hmm. actually focuses on his monstrosity, he just mentions that he is three-bodied. We don't know whether he means um, three-headed or three-bodied. This is a big issue in Stesichorus. Uh, Hesiod mentions that he is three-bodied. Three so, um, and um, 
so I would like, I mean, in this way, like, for example, Stesichorus represented in a very uh, positive way. Uh, so do you think that this uh, Stesichorus' presentation is compatible with a Homeric presentation? Is it a dividing line? Uh, this is w where I would like to have your uh, comment. But if, if I remember uh, uh, right, he's he's um, in Sicarius. He's portrayed in a very favourable light, isn't he? Yes, yes, yes. Almost as, as, as an, uh, 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 an Agathos heros, as a, as a heroic, uh, as a heroic figure. And um, w one thing that comes right immediately to my mind is that um, monsters can be um, ambivalent. They can, as I said, they can be ugly, half nymph, right, and half serpent, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he um, combines both. Uh, so he's truly hybrid uh, in moral terms, you might say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, somebody, a, a social historian, might say, well, this betrays a sort of um, allegorizing of cultural contact in mm -hmm. southern Italy, and perhaps. Um, we're talking about, a, if I may say, um, a mestizo society, which is becoming, um, which is interpenetrating one, so, so, the, the colonists or the colonials are coming in, into contact with the, the in, indigenes. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it might betray that, or it just is rarely thinking aloud about um, things combining or forces combining, social forces, cultural forces combining. Okay, I think um, th 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 this is a very insightful comment that you made that exactly, let's say that even social uh, conditions form uh, their representation, at least the literary representation of monsters mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. this uh, representation is, let's say, the outcome of social and ethnical contact. Right. The and ethnic, sorry, contact. Yes, and ethnic contacts. Um, so you might say he's an ethnic or racial, an ethnic monster. He mm -hmm. is the other, um, but uh, the, 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 the bridge or the, the gap is not absolute. It's not yes. incommensurable. Yes, yes. You see. yes. It's not the total other. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I, I should say that he was the, the son of. Is it Cali Roy? The, the yes, Cali Roy is his mother, and uh, Hrisaur is his father. And it is that that both these, uh, well, certainly Hrisaur, like Pegasus, came from Medusa's. Who, Medusa. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Behedment, her, her beheading. Mm -hmm. um, so they, and Pegasus is is absent from the uh, account mm -hmm. of the Rafon. Uh, exploits in the Iliad uh, 6. Uh, right. the and one thing. thing that this raises for me, Yanis, is um, you mentioned Polyphemus is a particular favorite uh, in terms of your research. Uh, and there are some really sort of positive sort of later poems about him where he's sort of wooing his love, right? Um, yes. Can you say a little bit about that maybe? Well, he, he lends himself he's, uh, to, to do uh, grotesquerie. I mean, he's he's easily made into a, a lovelorn bucolos, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Exactly. It's all about you know. Look at you. You know, even though I have the shaggy eyebrow, right? Um, you yes. could still love me. Yeah. yeah and, and, and it's it's um, it's a sort of uh, Schadenfreude. You 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 take um, delight in the physical deformity of. Of, of somebody, it's it's a bit like the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. So you might say it's it's the same sensibility, or the um, which which um, Theocritus, for instance, and and Ovid uh, uh, took advantage of. Right, right. So beautiful. So, so Yannis, you know, we actually have a question in our Q and A um, oh. from a community member. So I was hoping we could turn to. Can I just grab my my Theogony. I, oh, I, please, I, yes. Uh, I, I didn't have a chance to get it. Yes, absolutely. Please do. Here I have it. Please, I'm, I'm all ears. Okay, that's great. So, um, so actually, one of our community members, Kimmy, uh, has two comments. Um, first, she says, "I'm struck by the similarities between monsters and demigod heroes. 
at war or in combat, extreme in physical, mental abilities, bestiality, Achilles would eat his enemy's flesh, raw, berserk state, hybrids, demigod heroes are hybrids, deformity. Right. Yeah, do you have any uh, reaction to that? that? That's a beautiful comment. Um, well, man himself is a hybrid. Um, How do you, what do you mean by that? Not, not to mention um, heroes who are extraordinary men, but ordinary men um, are, are um, well, according to one um, Hesiotic tradition or uh, post-Hesiotic tradition, men uh, are descended from the blood of the um, from from the, the giants, I think, um, and the Meliae, the the um, uh, ash nymphs. Um, so, um, and and men seem to have come into being. There's an anthropogony. It's implicit. Uh, I think it's 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 quite implicit. It's it's um, in in the theogony. It takes place sometime after the castration of the uh, uh, sky. Um, so man is d is descended from uh, the giants, the gigantes. Uh, and the giants, in, in their turn, are um, descended from the blood of sky. Um, so men are a mixed bag themselves. Uh, heroes uh, are hybrids too, um, being descended, well, at least conceptually, they're just half and half, you know, half man, half god. Um, so um, I think the Greeks and, and many ancient peoples were, were um, fascinated with, with hybridity, with the notion of hybridity, um, and, and, and how close man is to beast and animal and, um, you know, the, the, the well-known subject of the distinction between gods and men, uh, this spectrum of god gods, men, animals, what is the relation between them? Um, so, um, yes, indeed, um, Achilles goes berserk. Um, he raves uh, like a wolf, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. He develops lursa, which is probably related to... Um, oh, right. For, uh, right? Uh, being what a beautiful rabid. thought, yes. Beautiful, lursa. beautiful. And 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 um, his his um, squadron of myrmidons are compared outright to wolves, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, man, animal, a monster, they're, they're very close. And 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 don't forget that these very suave phaeacians are themselves monstrous. They're descended from the gi uh, gigantes themselves. Um, if if you right. the, 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 they're monstrous too. It's not only the Cyclopes, and in fact they're distantly, well not too distantly related to the Cyclopes via Poseidon, at least in the Odyssey. So um, hybridity is, is very important. That's one of the reasons I've been researching it. It's not simply a, a modern or a postmodern concept. Um, and it, it helps us to think about the other when you, you see, I'm sort of, I'm quoting or misquoting uh, Leach, the, the anthropologist, when you see a, a man with a, a lion's head, you think about the lion and the man, you see, in one go, but also separately, and you try to uh, compare and contrast the two. So this is um, something that's inherent in, in Greek poetry, certainly, hybridity. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So, you know, um, Yanis, we have about 10 minutes left. So in, do we have any urgent questions now? Or maybe this might be a good moment to read a passage together because I, I'm so eager to just sort of get right into a text with you. We have a few minutes. Yes. Have, would you like to read the uh, passage or...? Sure. Uh, maybe Sarah could read. What, what do you have in mind for us, Yanis? Um, could, could you read uh, Cerberus, uh, the passage about... Uh, Cerberus. It's uh, Theogony 310 through 12. And um, as we're bringing that up, I just want to let everybody know that we have um, 
that if you are watching this uh, now, uh, if you go to the website, uh, Hour 25, and the associated blog post there, uh, you can find the fo a, a document with the focus passages. Uh, and even if you're watching this later on uh, via recording, you can still access that document. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So this is from our source book translation. Uh, with her, they say that he found associated in love a terrible and lawless ravisher for the dark-eyed maid, and she, having conceived, bore fierce-hearted children, the dog Orthos, first she bore for Garion, and next, in the second place, she brought forth the irresistible and ineffable flesh-devourer, Berberus, dog of hell, with brazen voice and with fifty heads, a bold and strong beast. Thirdly, again, she gave birth to the Lyonian Hydra, subtle in destruction, and here a white-armed goddess reared, implacably hating the mighty Heracles. Right. Thank you. Well, um, any thoughts about that, that passage? If, if what strikes me is that, first of all, Cerberus, or Cabros, is unmanageable, <laughs> as, as Martin West would say. He's intractable. Amekanon, just as his mum is. His mother is Echidna. So he's intractable, um, unmanageable, and not to be spoken. Uti fateon, um, unpronounceable. His very name brings bad luck. His very name is an abomination. Of course, unspeakable can also mean, secondarily, it might mean beyond description. It's, it's, it's more neutral. But I think in the first instance, just to say his name brings bad luck, Kerberos. So he's unspeakable, Ute Fation. And notice that we have these negatives at the very start of the description. He's introduced uh, through negative description, uh, through negative terms. Um, and he's snaky, not sneaky. I suppose the words are related, the two English words, but he, he has, he's, he's uh, snake, snake serpentine. Um, and I, I wonder about those 50 heads. Are, are they truly serpentine, um, given that his parents are Dracondes, um, Echidna and Typhoeus? Um, and what about his teeth? No mention of his teeth, but he is Omestes. He is a raw-eating creature. He eats things raw. And, of course, the raw versus the cook cooked. It's, uh, cooking is a cultural marker. So this is very, very important. Um, Poly Polyphemus is uh, omestes, or he proves to be truly omestes. Mind you, you can be omestes if you eat only vegetables, uncooked vegetables. But in either case, it's, it's primitive behavior. Uh, but the primitive shades into the paradisiacal, so it's, it's also paradise. So cannibals are linked to paradise. Um, so he, he, he does, uh, Cerberus does, I, I know but later in the Theogony, he does end up eating men, which is strange, in Hades. Uh, in other words, such men as try to escape uh, through the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades. Um, pre presumably they're Sukai, but he, he gobbles them up, he eats them. The, the, the word is esthie, if I'm not mistaken. So he, he behaves like an Iliatic dog. And a dog does what a hero would love to do, but doesn't. He eats the carrion of warriors after battle. So that, that's what I would say. they're trying to escape. Sorry, um, yes. So it, if, if, he, if he eats them after they're trying to escape from Hades, surely they, they should in Hades, so is he kind of keeping some sort of order, despite being monstrous? He, he's, I'm sorry? Uh, what did if, you... if he's eating them, if they're trying to escape from Hades, they mm -hmm. should stay in Hades once they are suche. Oh, yes. um, they shouldn't really try to escape, and so is he keeping some sort of order in that realm, that, that different realm, that other realm? Oh. Yes, 
Well, well, in a perverse way, he is keeping order. But mind you, most Draconis or many monsters are guardians. So he, he's a very good uh, sentry dog, uh, but a guardian. And, and, um, um, and many monsters go back to the master or mistress of animals. Um, Barker uh, shows this beautifully in his recent book. Um, what do you Man. mean by that, Yanis? Um, well, this Paleolithic and Bronze Age deity who um, guards flocks. Um, so he's a, he's a, a um, canonical guardian, and he makes sure he makes sure that uh, human beings don't eat too many of the flock, and that there's a, an equilibrium between flocks consumed and human beings who are uh, eaten by the uh, monster in revenge, or in a sort of ecological revenge. So th this is a, a, a well-known fact from archaeology, um, going back to um, the Stone Ages, and uh, Walter Borkert has, has uh, researched this beautifully, and, and Barker has, has carried on in this vein. So the uh, guardian figure, go back to Kerberos, um, I think ultimately goes back to these masters of animals. And you find them also in, in uh, indigenous Brazilian um, mythology and religion, that there's a master of, of animals who keeps guard, stands guard. Right. I'm thinking about Argos uh, mm. as maybe one manifestation of that, perhaps? That's right, Argos, Argos, yeah. Was in, in some, I mean, he's monstrous in many ways, right? With different variations of him. Sometimes he has a hundred eyes. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Doesn't sleep. Um, yes. That yes. mental acuity. Uh, Janet may have a question, actually, I see. Yes. Janet. Hi. Um, are monsters afraid of Zeus? You know, all the other lesser gods are somehow afraid of Zeus. Um, what's the relationship between monsters and Zeus? Well, they, uh, in, in the strange chronology of the Theogony, they, they seem to have preceded, or most of them, or many of them, are, uh, were born before Zeus. Uh, they're anti-Zeus, um, by definition. Um, Typhoeus is the last of the lot, you might say, his final challengers. Um, and he's very symmetrical to Zeus, if you read that passage very closely. The two are very, very close uh, in terms of power and fierceness. And when Zeus attacks Typhoeus, one wonders whether Zeus is just as, as savage as, as his victim. But anyway, um, he defeats Typhoeus. Um, so I, I would, and then exiles him to the depths of the earth, and that's what you do to, to monsters if you can. Um, so um, yes, they, they are um, opponents of Zeus's order, um, and Tufuerus, um is is actually silenced by Zeus. He's outmonstered by Zeus, <laughs> you might say. He's outmonstered. Uh, Zeus uses uh, fire uh, and and uh, thunder and lightning, uh, but also um, huge sounds, um, extraordinary uh, vociferation to outshout and and to silence this monster. So uh, we don't know if, if afterwards he's he's afraid of Zeus. We because Zeus has burnt his tongues, well certainly his heads. Um, he's cauterized him, so he has no no way to talk. Um, not that he spoke, except as a god. Notice he had the, he has a gallery of voices. It's a gallery of animals, uh, shape shifting. Um, I, I believe Tifereus is is a sort of master of animals. Um, but anyway, they the anti Zeus by definition. Um, hence their link, the link of some of them to Hera, uh, Zeus's occasional antagonist. Um, and and I, I but I don't know if they fear Zeus. I, I can't recall of any any uh, utterance to that effect. 
Janice, you know, unfortunately, we still have questions, um, and there's so much more to discuss, but unfortunately, it's already 12 o'clock. Uh, our time together went so quickly, uh, and we really appreciate your sharing your expertise on this topic, your passion for it. It's such a fun topic. Um, it's, you know, it's fun, yes. And, and thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much. I hope it wasn't a monstrous treatment. <laughs> no, totally beautiful. The, really, the sublime. I know other people are trying to say things, but they're muted, so I hope they'll feel free to unmute and just thank you. Um, I, I want to thank everyone, all our community members who joined us here, all our viewers who are watching us online. Thank you so much. I just want to let you know to save the date. So next Thursday at 11 o'clock, uh, Maria Zanatu, who's already here, uh, will be joining us to lead a discussion of her own on, um, I, I think, maternal figures in, um, in archaic Greek literature. Is that correct, Maria? Thank you so much. So thank you, Yanis. Thank you to all everyone who joined us today. It, it's just such a great pleasure to spend this time talking about beautiful literature with thank all you. of you. Uh, and thank we look you. forward to talking again soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a lovely afternoon. Bye-bye.